And now we have a paper by Dr. Garabet Munjan. Uh, Dr. Munjan earned his MA and PhD uh, from UCLA, majoring in Armenian history with various uh, minor fields. Uh, he has taught at the uh, state uh, Northridge and other colleges, and in 2001 he started working as a Middle East security analyst for uh, various uh, federal agencies. Uh, he continues uh, doing so uh, to now. Munjan is the author of the arguments of the Viennese Armenian uh, Turkish platform. He is uh, the uh, author of a number of uh, essays and his PhD dissertation is currently under publication uh, by the University of Utah. Uh, today, he will be uh, discussing the Armenian Revolutionary Federation's uh, seven and eight general congresses in 1913 and 14. Uh, and the subtitle is Ambitious uh, Politics versus Stark Realities. Uh, I, I would also, is it working? Yeah. I would also accept my thanks to Suryam for giving us the uh, to be present here and uh, uh, addressing you. <clears throat> uh, I want to start uh, with a uh, saying by Buddha to put this into context in a sense, uh, especially since we are in a, in a period where the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide is being commemorated and there is always the problematic issue of this hatred between these two peoples, a journey into revenge dig two graves before you start that journey. Uh, this paper that I'm presenting is in a way a compendium to a much larger paper that I had presented at a conference in Sarajevo titled World War I and the End of the Ottoman Empire, uh, where I did it 1909-1915. It will be published in a couple of months. Upon reading the manuscript, some colleagues were interested in knowing more about the discussions and the decisions of the ARF, Armenian Revolutionary Federation or Tashnak Sutyun, general congresses for the period 1912-1914. Armenian-Turkish relations under discussion desperately need to be revisited and reevaluated. The meager historical discourses developed thus far by Western and perhaps more importantly by Armenian and Turkish historians are not only linear, rehashed, and thus outdated, but are also problematic in terms of their inability to deliver a clear picture of the complex issues under discussion. The relation between the ARF and the CUP, Committee of Union and Progress, after the Constitutional Revolution in 1908 is by all means a complex and multifaceted one. Indeed, archival records from at least four distinct repositories, Russian, Ottoman, British, and ARF, which I use, imply directly or indirectly that in the period under discussion, the main actors within the ARF and the CUP espoused an anti-Russian stance, which characterized the history of the ARF-CUP relations from 1909 to at least 1930 and up to 1914, as shall be seen. Contrary to, to the current dominant historiography, which underlines the enduring power struggle between the CUP and the ARF during this period, my paper argues that the relations were close and even cordial most of the time. <coughs> the problematic issue was that during the period under discussion, the Ottoman central government was weak in the eastern periphery. It has always been weak in the eastern periphery. And was so preoccupied with several daunting military operations elsewhere, like the one in Yemen, and then the Libya one, and then the Balkan Wars, that it 
to provide security and to realize the return of lands, even though efforts were made in that regard to Armenians, especially in the eastern provinces. As noted earlier, the ARF continued its political cooperation with the CUP regardless of what transpired in Adana in April 1909. The two parties also signed agreements in 1909 and 1910 respectively. They even created a joint body to oversee the implementation of the points of the agreements. The experiment was partially successful, especially regarding the return of some lands grabbed by Kurdish chieftains in the past. However, while Constantinople, Izmir, and other cities in West Asia Minor were enjoying the fruits of the newly established constitutional regime, the very same regime had not yet made its way into the eastern vilayets of the empire, where Rostom, Stepan Zorian, traveled to Van from Salmas, most probably in the summer of 1909. He reported, for instance, that, quote, the Ottoman constitution has not yet reached Van, where all database, literary valley base, uh, generally meaning autonomous things, still rule. Whatever is ceded is temporary, and the old regime people are hiding behind, behind the mass of Italians. End quote. The ARF 6th General Congress, convened in 1911 in the building in Constantinople, the Congress came in the wake of the ARF CUP meeting in February 2011, during which a heated debate ensued concerning the troubling situation in the eastern provinces. It must be noted that the ARF stand executing the ARF, starting from 1903-1905 with the issue of the confiscation of the church properties, and then the 1905-1906 Armenian or Armeno-Tatar clashes, which were instigated by the, the Tsarist of Prana, and then finally the constitutional revolution. These are issues that I uh, deal with in my uh, longer I'm not going to bring them here. Uh, Many of the high-level cadres of the Eastern Bureau, because of this process, uh, were in prison, while others had gone hiding underground. Hence, only those Eastern Armenian leaders who were already in the were present at the meeting, the sixth uh, meeting. What is important to emphasize here is the precise timing, however, uh, that the Tsarist government initiating its diplomatic demarche uh, in June 1912, uh, which was the time of the Balkan War, the First Balkan War. The campaign of ethnic cleansing of the Balkan Muslims had created a really human tragedy as hundreds of thousands of destitute muhajirs were flocking in from the Balkan provinces and being literally dumped into Istanbul uh, only to be on their way sent to the eastern provinces of the empire. The CUP had no other choice but to stage a brutal coup d'etat uh, in early 1913 and to take control of the government like a gangster story where they came and shot a couple of people and took over the government. It was becoming clearer by the minute that most of the Christians, Bulgarians, Serbs, Macedonians, and even Muslim ethnicities like the Albanians, Arabs, and Kurds were starting to disassociate themselves from the crumbling empire. It could also be argued that the CUP's problem was managerial in nature rather than ideological. The Turkish revolutionaries of yesteryear, who had become statesmen of the time, were in awe over losing everything. They urgently needed all their ethnic elements to side with them at such a startling moment. From this perspective, it appears that Russia's timing in reintroducing the belated Armenian reforms that were dormant for 40 years, as uh, Professor uh, Zurker mentioned, uh, ultimately led Armenians back to Russian favoritism and thus put an end to their cooperation with the CUP. Perhaps it was this crucial abandonment of an in need that the letter. It is logical to assume that this turnabout of Russian policy towards favoring Armenians again was, to say the least, troubling for the Kurds, who had hoped that their collaboration with the Russians during the past years, and I'm speaking especially about a Russian policy of being pro-Kurdish and even arming the Kurds, 
because they, he needed them, it needed them in uh, fighting against uh, constitutionalists in the Iranian revolution. Uh, troubled the Kurds, who had hoped that their collaboration with the Russians during the past years was going to be in their favor. It was this issue coupled with the possibility of the Armenian Reform Treaty finally being signed that the Kurds saw as a real danger to their very existence and patrimonial rights in the eastern provinces. The ARF 6th General Congress was held from August 17 to 24, uh, actually the 7th, I should say, uh, in 1913 in Garin Erzurum. The most important is with this. Now, there is a problem here because usually in historiography, we, uh, it is never in the ties. Up until, 19, uh, up, up until the coup, uh, the internal coup by which the CUP came to power in 1913, the government and the CUP were different things. Even though the CUP had lots of muscle within the government, but it was not the government. So there is a, a problem here when we speak about Severing the ties with the government would be up until 1913. After that, it can be understood that it was severing ties with the CUP. But in 1912, when that action was taken, it is interesting to note that uh, the severing ties didn't mean necessarily severing the ties with the CUP. Uh, the CUP members of the government had continued unabated then. The Congress also discussed issues pertaining to the agrarian condition and the Armenian lands still in Kurdish possession. Moreover, the security and self-defense of Armenians in the against Kurdish rebellion was a time of Kurdish rebellion, as was stated in the morning sessions. Also on the agenda of the now, Simon Zavarian, one of the founding members of the ARF, reported to the meeting, to the Congress, that per the decision of the ARF 6th General Congress of 1911, the ARF Council had decided in May 1912 to establish a for our relations with Ittihad. For this reason, and from him, it had formulated a document consisting of 10 points regarding the most important of our demands, uh, such as the return of lands and parochial properties, the council had decided that if such conditions were not, the party would cut its relations with the government. Okay, notice the uh, problematic issue of saying government instead of it. Uh, the ARF council decided to maintain a loyal stance within the empire. The sixth general congress had also decided to work on arming the population. When the war started, the council finished his report by explaining how the Russians approached the ARF with the new Armenian reform package. Quoting again from him, his report, during this time, the Russians started a rapprochement with us. Ambassador Charles announced that the Tsarist government's treatment vis-a-vis -vis Armenian and the ARF in particular has now changed. He even agreed that I'm to rectify that situation. We told them no qualms regarding this, and that they have to show their good faith by making them against him. Was the delegate from this was Sasun, the rebellious area of all times, and uh, the representative is Kalu Sasuni, who is the brother of Garo Sasuni. And he says, I quote, Our organization had severed its relations with Ittihad, that should have not happened. It seems that during conditions of war like that of the Balkan Wars, our leaders are changing their directions for personal reasons. The reply to Sasuni's, sorry, acerbic remarks came from Nikola Hvalya, a member of the Eastern Bureau. He says, quote, when the Balkan War started, we had a dilemma in that many Muslim deportees from the Balkans could be brought over to be settled in the Armenian provinces of the Ottoman Empire. The Eastern Bureau even asked the Viceroy of the Caucasus to permit the ARF to buy 12,000 rifles from the government at very decent prices and to allow it to transfer the weapons over the border. The Viceroy completely defeated our proposition and even informed us, 
informed us that he is, it is afraid that those weapons could in the future be used against his government. He moreover renounced such an idea on the basis that it would soon be known to the other Western powers and would be considered as incitement by Russia of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. Not being content with Apalian's answer, Kalus Sasuni once again took the podium and spoke. And I'm quoting, it seems that our comrades in Constantinople and in Tiflis had fallen into the hands of the Russians because they lack farsightedness. I can say without hesitation that they have become a sort of Russian agents and entered an adventure whose consequences could be detrimental to our people. If we continue on this path, we will become traitors, when in reality we should remain loyal citizens of the Ottoman Empire. We should ask the government to satisfy our demands, and we should wait for those demands to be satisfied incrementally. Thus, I ask that we stop such political maneuvering and work only on finding means to defend our people. Let us get stronger and make the government accede to our demands. Many delegates after this sided with, uh, uh, with uh, Kalus uh, Sasuni, and one of those who came up and spoke after him was Vramia from Val. I also want to be on the record in condemning the politics of the Constantinople body, Western Bureau, meaning. It seems that our comrades there have been acting without consulting the provincial bodies. We are not fully informed about such actions as severing ties with Ittihad. Our comrades should know that their power base is in the provinces. Even the supposedly pro-Russian delegate from St. Petersburg, Babalian, underlined the fact that, and it is, I'm quoting from what he said, both the Western and Eastern bureaus had made a mistaken assumption. They had tried to turn our masses into accepting Russian occupation of the eastern provinces, especially condemning his conduction of such policy as asking the Russians for weapons. Such politics endanger our people in the Armenian eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire and also in the Caucasus. By so doing, they are creating a valley between us Armenians and people in the area with whom we want to establish friendly relations. By so doing, they are planting the seeds of future massacres by the Turks. Our only action should be that of reforms through political means. It is the task of this General Congress to rectify the mistake that has been made. On the issue of self-defense, for many of the delegates, what was understood by self-defense per, uh, per se concerned mostly the defense of Armenians in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire against Kurdish depredations. The consensus was that in this, even the government would not be against Armenians and the ARF, since they would be simply doing what the government couldn't accomplish because of its limited resources. Zavarian here once again gives a, a report about what the Bureau had done. Some of our esteemed comrades in Constantinople, uh, at, uh, actually after Zavarian spoke, Vramian once again takes the uh, podium and says, and I'm quoting here, some of our esteemed comrades in Constantinople think that by joining the opposition, we will have a political edge. Inform us, what kind of edge did we gain by severing our ties with the government? If you ask my opinion, I would suggest that all bodies working in the provinces should continue their relations with the local CUP governments. If you all had followed the example of Van, and he is from Van, by the way, our situation would have been better by now. self meant not arming the people per se, but rather to find a solution to the Kurdish brigandage. Even the local government was obliged to help us in our efforts. We have to provide weapons to individuals so that they protect their families. Amassing weapons will lead to such events as those that happened in Van in 1907-1908. Even land grab issues can be solved if we as a people show that we are unable, we are able to defend ourselves. It's not for nothing that the local government in Van provided us with 500 rifles for such purposes. I ask that the same methods that we were that were used in Van 
become the norm for the organization in other provinces. Uh, the issue was discussed during the ninth session also of the Congress. Now, Armen Garo reported on the matter and tried to underline the reason for severing the party's relations with the CUP. Once again, Kalus Sasumi was adamantly against it. If the head and the government are one and the same, he said. If you are, if they are, if they were unable to grant us many compromises, it is because both of us despair. It is for this reason that I can't be so exacting and unreasonable regarding Ittihad. By declaring that we had severed our relations with Ittihad also means that we have severed our ties with the government. To completely mistrust Ittihad means that we are being audacious and imprudent. After all, it is the only element that we can count on. Then Armengaru comes in and tries to implement or present his point of view. Ittihad is also moving forward with the same politics. It's our estimation. It's not a friendly gesture. It is because of this policy of Ittihad that it stood away from implementing the reforms it had promised us. I can't put hope on such a party. Ittihad has ventured into an enterprise of friendship towards the Islamists, etc. At this point, one of the leading members of the party, Rostom, comes up and says his mind what just had been spoken by Armen Karo. In my opinion, the comrade Armen Karo, who took the floor, is making a big mistake also. Is it possible for us to get complete independence? No. Therefore, we are obliged to live with the Turkish and especially the Kurdish elements. In the past, we had no such formidable organization on our side like the Ittihad. We just shook hands Cabby emigrate Turkish revolutionaries. Therefore, to sever our ties with now with an organization because of which we are in a better shape now means that we will torpedo our own aims. Is that as long as they are not pursuing a policy of pan-Turkism, we must work with them. Also, please don't forget that we are at odds with Etilaf, the other uh, Turkish party. Okay. If one doesn't pay enough attention to these structural changes, they might seem logical and necessitated by the times. However, taking con into consideration most of the confrontation regarding the Western Bureau decision to sever ties with the CUP came from delegates from the Eastern provinces, and also taking into consideration the diluted character of the new decision regarding those relations, some key observations are in order. It seems that I won't be able to go into the uh, Congress, and I will uh, finish my uh, presentation uh, with the Seventh Congress. So those two points that I uh, extracted from the minutes uh, are as follows. It is mostly probable that it is the ARF Armenia Bureau, and this was something because there were already two bureaus, the Eastern and the Western bureaus. Now, a third uh, one was added, which is the Armenia Bureau, uh, comprising of the six Eastern Vilayets plus uh, Trabzon, uh, was a matter of negotiation between the Western Bureau members, like Zavarian and Armenkaro, and representative of the Eastern provinces, most probably Rostom and Vramian. Moreover, it is also clear that the delegate from Tiflis, Nikola Palian, had also played a lower role in this new arrangement because this would preoccupy Rostom and Vramian with the Eastern Provinces and the new Eastern Bureau, comprised of only members from the Caucasus. This new Eastern Bureau will go and work with the Russian government, while the Western Bureau is going to work with the, with the Western government, and the Armenia Bureau is going to work with the local CUP members, creating a behemoth with three heads, where the three heads could not have any relationship or uh, can think uh, together. This is what happened in the in, in this uh, 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 instance. Uh, the only other thing I want to add, I know I know that my time is up, is that concerning the Congress, is that was there a decision uh, in Russia after what you heard uh, in the third regarding the seventh uh, Congress decisions and the uh, discussions? 
believe me that there was no such thing in 1914. As a matter of fact, one of the decisions that was taken was that uh, the ARF would ask the government uh, to give it more arms to create militias, local militias, in order to protect the situation in case the Russian armies invaded the land. And this is something that uh, we have to still take into consideration because just new stuff are coming out. Now, let me conclude by saying that, that uh, as, as I started, that there are lots of things that need to be revisited and, e and even most probably a new historical paradigm has to be constructed uh, of all of this. Uh, it is said that the errors of the past uh, are the wisdom of the future. Have we gotten anything from there? It's, it's questionable. Uh, what I try to do today is something that I uh, like a lot from George Orwell, who says, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Thank you. <laughs>